The following is an exclusive presentation of WI Garden Media, the voice of Garden Talk Radio. Coming up on the program today, we're going to be talking about ornamental grasses as well as the history of canning. Our guest will be Carly McQuarrie, and we'll answer your garden questions. The hour is jam-packed, and it starts right now. You are listening to the most informationally packed hour of garden-focused radio in the country and on the Internet with your host, husband and wife team, Joey and Holly Baird. This is the Gardening with Joey and Holly radio show. Welcome to the Gardening with Joey and Holly radio show. Thank you for being part of the program today and joining us. I am your host, Joy Barrett. Beside me is my wife, co-host, best friend, and gardening partner, Holly Barrett. This program is for you, about you, to help your garden grow better, to maintain your landscape, grow healthier trees, make your grass look greener, as well as preserving what you grow. Uh, We want to thank you for however you're capturing the program, whether you're listening to us on one of the 15 radio frequencies that are carrying our program here in 2021 through a radio app, through our parent website, the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com, at the Season 5 tab at the top of the page, podcast replay or in-studio video replay. Thank you so much. You want to be part of the program, you can certainly do that by uh, giving us uh, giving us a call at 1-800-927-SHOW, 1-800-927-7469. If you've got a question, say uh, you'd like to say a hi, uh, you can just do that. If we can't get you on the program, leave a message. We'll call you back. If you'd like to send us an email, that is also a very easy avenue in which to communicate with us. Garden Talk Radio at gmail.com. That's Garden Talk Radio at gmail.com. If you are sending us a question in regards to a situation that you're facing, if you can kindly attach a couple of additional photographs to that situation so we can better help uh, provide you with the correct answer, we'd be much appreciated. So, Holly, let's get into the program. And we're going to go over, we're going to talk about in segment one here, ornamental grasses. Yeah, so there's, um, I guess, two types of ornamental grasses. One is like a true ornamental grass, and then another one is like a shrub or a plant that has a grass-like appearance, like a like a sedge. Uh-huh. Um, and so you would use it for a similar purpose. So most grasses are perennials, so that's something to keep in mind. You can find um, annual... Per- per- perennials, meaning they come back year after year with a little maintenance on your end. Right. Yeah. You can find annual grasses. People will often put those like in containers. Mm-hmm. Those are smaller grasses. So we're going to talk more about like the the permanent grasses. The easier ones. Right. Plant it and forget it to a certain degree. Right. Now, why would one may choose to put ornamental grasses on their property? Well, for one, you can use it as an ornamental access, accent, accent piece. Making it pretty. Making it pretty. Mm-hmm. You can use it to create like a like a shrub sort of hedge thing. like a hedge yeah like a you know like a, you do bunch, plant a bunch of them next to each other okay and then you have like a a, a wall a living wall. A wall yeah a wall of grass and, um, and and now you know some people may be thinking well why would i just want tall grass when I, you know on my property this is not necessarily just tall grass there they have specific and very unique characteristics They don't spread necessarily like, you know, grass or weeds do. Um, They have a very aesthetic, pleasing appearance when you put them on your property. Right. And a lot of people like how because they're basically like thinner, taller plants, Mm -hmm. you know, when they blow in the wind or even just the rain or maybe a a tiny little bird or it's pretty to watch the bugs on it whatever so a lot of times it's just um you know for for whatever there's not really like it's not going to improve something or something a lot of times it's just for the aesthetic right yeah so that's um that's why you would you would uh grow grow grass now there now most of these grasses that are available they can grow between three and basically eight nine feet tall and can be grown in growing zones, USDA growing zones, between about 3 and 10. So that really covers a very large gamut that maybe one doesn't work well for your area, but there's three or four other ones that would work well for your area. Right. And 
we found um, that there there is a variety of grasses that can be grown in those different zones. So, and most grasses are pretty forgiving, and that's another reason maybe why you would want to grow them, because they usually just require normal soil. They require just rainwater for the most part, unless you. And a lot of them are drought tolerant. Mm-hmm. Um, so, unlike unless, a shrub where there's a little more maintenance and potentially problems that could come up. Uh, when you have a, a bunch of shrubs on your property, grasses pretty pretty easy. Right now, there are ones that do spread, uh-huh. and so that's something to keep in mind. That at some point you might have to divide them, so which that's, is it, it, not a bad thing. No, because you're paying an upfront cost in order to purchase these. Not are not necessarily something that you're going to buy seed for and then start them in a grow cell and then take and transplant them outside. You're no, typically the buying these as a fairly decent size plant right you're most of the time you're going to your local garden center and you're purchasing these these uh plants and then you're going to plant them where you want them right. and you should definitely do your research because if you find out that it's maybe like one square foot right now and it spreads to i don't know five six square feet whatever depending on where you plant yeah. that uh, you may not have that space available Right. So, and some people will even plant them in raised beds, which is is uh, is fun too because it does provide them really good drainage a lot of times. But it's not you don't just have to put them directly into the ground. You do have some options where you could put them in a raised bed. Right. And with them, uh, at some point you have to. Some of these you're able to divide or hack in half and then hack again. So basically, you take one giant plant and you can divide it into four separate uh, root balls. You've expanded and you've really decreased the value or the, the amount of money you've spent on it. Let's say you spent, I don't know, I'm picking random numbers here, uh, $10, uh, $10 on a plant. Now you've divided that up in four pieces. That $10 is really, each plant has gotten a lot cheaper. And then over a course of time, it gets cheaper until you're basically looking at pennies every time you divide. Right. And then there are there are grasses for different areas. Right. There's full shade uh full sun partial shade you know there's that too so you don't you're not limited to versatility yeah you definitely have a lot of versatility and a lot of times with most plants if it's meant to be in partial shade it'll it'll grow in shade it's just not going to grow as large or as prevalent or let's take a look at some what are some uh that we would recommend here uh feather reed grass that's well, one, a, oh, one go, thing go I ahead touch before we get into is, that is planting so some of these you depending where you're in the you are in the country mm-hmm. you could essentially plant them in the fall most people in the north plant them in the spring a lot of times it'll recommend to divide them in the fall um, so you have to pay attention to what you're growing okay so there and then the maintenance yeah the maintenance well let's go over the maintenance uh, before we get into the types of varieties here yeah so watering. Um, it, they just it kind of it kind of can vary by the species, but for the most part, again, it's like one inch of water per week, and then a lot of these varieties are now more drought tolerant as they become more hybridized um, <clears throat> when it comes to the the, the species. Uh, well, let's uh, when, let's talk about the trimming or the cutting back because you don't necessarily. It's best. It's recommended to at the end of the season cut it back, but. I guess if you don't cut it back, it can still be fine, but it helps if you do cut it back to get it to reset or reestablish for the next growing season. Right. You yeah, you want to make sure that you cut back the grasses with before the new season's growth starts, and that's good to keep in mind. Most of these grasses do not require fertilization. Mm-hmm. Um and actually some like too much nitrogen could cause problems. So you want to just Use just a happy, healthy soil, and they're going to do their thing. And you want to cut the stems back just a few inches above ground level for the best appearance. Get rid of that old growth and trim it back with either uh, trimmers or <clears throat> secutures or whatever you have in order to make a clean cut, make it a buzz cut on it, and then you're good to go. Let it grow, and the way it takes off. Yeah, for sure. And then most grasses, you know, you divide them about every three to four years. And if they're not divided, they will become thin. They'll die out. They'll kind of choke themselves up. Right, out. right. Exactly. That's what you got to be aware of. So there is some maintenance when it comes to that. We're just going to uh, ramble off a few varieties here uh, that we would maybe recommend for you. Uh, big blue stem uh, grows three to eight feet tall, and it's uh, narrow in clumps. 
and uh, <clears throat> the clumps are, you know, you can get the clumps can be four to eight feet apart or a feet tall with a large uh, powder blue foliage on them. Uh, zoned four to ten, so that covers almost everybody in our listing area. Um, but so this. But there's another variety of that that grows in three to nine. Okay, the red October. Yeah, red October has narrow. Deep green leaves with red uh, streaks in them. So it really, some people who are landscapers or want a specific um, tint to their landscape foliage, some of these may can you know relate to their their house color or you know their fence color, whatever, because it's got that tinge of blue or that tinge of red in this instance. Right. So that's um. That's something that, you know, to keep in mind is what what color, you know, might people might think that grasses are going to be like green, green grass. Or That's yellow. all you get. Nope. Then we got some different colors <laughs> yeah. here that you can choose from. Um, so another one is side oats grandma. Um, so this is a beautiful native grass and it'll grow in sandy to clean clay soils. And that's zone four to nine. It gets about two to three feet. In there high. you go. If you don't want something that's eight feet tall at two to three foot is really a good um, uh choice for you yeah and then there's also a blue gamma uh-huh um it's called a mosquito grass and okay so the heads recommend or resemble mosquito larvae which, which may not be something <laughs> you want to see but that's and that zones three to nine uh, one, so what half to a foot in height so that kind of would be something you maybe want to put around right close to the house with that being one to two foot uh one half foot two foot high uh, yeah, and, and it's drought tolerant. Yeah, and you could put it with some other perennials that might be shorter or taller, and it's not gonna it's not going to overpower them. Mm-hmm. And we got another one, uh, feather reed grass. Yeah, so this grass um, is two to four feet tall. It has tall flower heads in the spring that turn to golden tan in the summer. And that's another thing is that we have some grasses around here, and they do. It's nice to watch them go from. Well, dead looking in the right. spring to turning to green, and then they turn to yellow, kind of like leaves on a tree. Yeah, it's like leaves on a tree, and you can kind of watch their their progression. So that's kind of fun. You might think, oh, grass is boring. I want the pretty flowering perennials, and da 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 da. But it's they can add also nice color. the the blowing in the in the breeze. Yeah, it, to some people it may be very calming and relaxing. I you find get, it calming. You and get relaxing. lost in the the moment in yeah. in the watching it. Some of the grass that there are planted. You you planted that mm-hmm. outside of the uh, the house. Okay. Mm-hmm. Good to know. Mm-hmm. Uh, what other options may we have here? Um, switchgrass. Uh, you got a couple of different choices here. You got heavy metal. You got cloud nine. Um, the cloud nine, five to seven foot tall, growing zone five to nine. Uh, heavy metal, four to five foot tall, growing zone five to nine. Um, so that's a couple of different options you got there. I I don't really know about this five to seven foot tall grass. Well, you're okay for people who don't know and who watch on the video. <laughs> you can't really tell heights, but you're just a niche over five foot. I'm five one. Okay, yeah, on a good day. On a good day. So you could get lost in in these. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, you know, be aware of that. Just imagine me standing on the other side of the grass, and you couldn't see me, and then you wouldn't know where I was. Right. And now keep in mind, when we talk about these grasses, when you look for ornamental grasses for your property, don't take our word for it. Do your research for your particular growing area. And then in most areas, you would purchase these grasses in containers at your garden center, your independent garden center in the spring, and then you bring them home and you plant them. Ask their advice. These people at your independent garden center, whether you're in Milwaukee, whether you're in in Yankton, whether you're in Boston, Kansas City, the people at the independent garden centers are hired because they have knowledge, not because they're fillers. They know to a certain degree what they're looking at and how to advise you on what to purchase. And if they don't, there's somebody on staff, there's a chain of command that they can get a hold of, whomever it is. These independent garden centers... Yes, they want you to buy their product, but they're not going to typically sell you something that, one, doesn't fit your requirements, and two, will not grow well for what your re- what your needs are just to sell you a plant. That's just it. And you might go to the big box store and... Convenience, but it, it's convenient, it doesn't... It, the know. convenience doesn't, you know, it's not, oh, great, you can you save $3, but you probably got the plant, not the right plant. 
Well, right. And the guy who sold you paint last week is now selling the grasses and you're going to say, hey, dude, what's this about? And he's like, that'll look nice in your uh-huh. yard. Yeah. yeah. That's that's about it. Yeah. And uh, so keep that in mind. And there's and there's like giant needle grass that can go uh, growing zone six to ten and get five to six feet tall. It's a arching and airy golden dandelion flower like uh, in in early and midsummer color to it. Uh, looks really nice. So there's many, many different sea oats. Sea oats is uh, 7 to 11 growing zone. Right. Well, growing zone 6 to 10 is not for us, but you know what is for us? What is for us, And Holly? for everybody? Uh-huh. Walton's. Okay. Walton's Inc. They have... They, our radio show is brought to you today by Walton's Inc. We know you care about where your food comes from. You might can you preserve your fruits and vegetables. But what about the meat? At waltonsinc.com, you can get all the equipment, seasoning, and supplies to make sausage, jerky, and any other meat product your way. And you might think, I don't eat meat or something. They I'm, also not, I'm, have, not, I'm not a hunter. I'm not a hunter. Yeah. I don't. Maybe I don't process meat. Maybe I didn't go buy half a cow from right. somebody. But, but they, they got that covered. They got seasoning. And kitchen uh, utensils and supplies and thermometers and everything else. All sorts of stuff. So maybe you eat a lot of potatoes. They got a great potato seasoning. So you can find all that information at waltonsinc.com. They also have, if you want to make some snack sticks or jerky that actually tastes good, if you go to meatgistics.com, it's an informational site to help you make the best finished product. And they have all of this at meatgistics.com and waltonsinc.com. Um, sausage stuffers, mixers, everything but the meat. And for you to save a little extra of your hard-earned cash, they've got a coupon code available just for you, the listeners of the Gardening with Joy and Holly radio show. Use coupon code GROW22, GROW22, at checkout to save 10% on your order of orders of over $50 And you also receive free shipping on that order. When we come back, hang around. It's going to be the history of canning jars. You're listening to the Garden with Joey and Holly radio show. Joey and Holly, send it via email anytime to gardentalkradio at gmail.com. We here at the Gardening with Joey and Holly radio show gardens understand that healthy soil is the key to a successful garden. We know that chemical fertilizer burns carbon out of the soil and kills the microbes needed for a healthy soil ecosystem. No worries. Chicken Soup for the Soil by Dr. Jim's will stimulate life into your soil, supplying all the nutrients most fertilizers neglect. Rather than force-feeding water-soluble chemical fertilizer, we suggest feeding the microbes a smorgasbord of 100% biodegradable nutrients that your plants can consume when they need them. The nutrients are readily available to maximize their genetic potential. Chicken soup for the soil will increase the quality of the fruit and vegetables you grow. Visit drgems.com. That's dr. J-I-M-Z dot com. Number one key to healthy, productive plants are the roots. Starting from seed to full-grown plants, RootMaker.com has the answer. From seed starting trays with an innovative design that air prunes the roots, creating a fabulous root system, never again will you have root-bound plants to multiple-gallon grow bag sizes to raise beds. RootMaker.com has your grow needs covered. Visit RootMaker.com. Use coupon code RADIO21 and get 15% off your entire order. Pomona's Universal Pectin is a high-quality pectin that gels reliably with low amounts of any sweetener. If you're trying to reduce the amount of sugar in your diet, you'll love Pomona's Universal Pectin. Now you can make healthy homemade jams and jellies sweetened to your taste. You can use sugar or honey to sweeten. Pomona's Universal Pectin keeps indefinitely when stored in an airtight container. Easy to use, versatile, and comes with directions and recipes in every box. Find out more and where to buy at PomonaPectin.com. Also available at natural food stores and online. Straight from the farm, fields, and briar patch, Piper and Leaf Artisan Tea is a tea like you've never imagined it. Get our award-winning tea delivered right to your front door and become part of the Piper and Leaf family. Free shipping over $75 at Piper and Leaf. Turf experts always say lawn season begins in the fall. It's the time to help grasses recover from summer stresses and thicken up so it can come back strong in the spring. This fall, you can fertilize, aerate, and dethatch your lawn using just one fantastic liquid product. It's called Lawn Force 5, a five-way lawn care kit in a bottle. Lawn Force 5 gives you a lush, healthy lawn you can be proud of. It improves your soil in a way 
that gives your lawn great color using 75% less nitrogen than typical lawn fertilizers. Visit our friends at natureslawn.com to find out more about this amazing Lawn Force 5 product. That's natureslawn.com. The Gardening with Joey and Holly radio show is brought to you by the following. Pro Plugger, Dripworks, Walton's Incorporated, Tree Diaper, Janie's Mill, Phylum Bioproducts, Chapin Manufacturing Incorporated, Nature's Lawn and Garden Incorporated, Deer Defeat, Dr. Jim's, Root Maker. Find all sponsors at the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com and thank them for their support. Welcome back to the Gardening with Joy and Holly radio show. Hydration problems? Never again when you use the tree diaper. Before tree diaper, let's be honest, watering trees, shrubs, and bushes was not your favorite job on your property. But with tree diaper, it's not really a job. Tree diaper is a revolutionary watering system that slowly releases stored rainwater when plants need it. The tree diaper is filled with water from rain or when you water and slowly slowly releases water over three weeks. No pipes, hoses, or electricity needed. Whether you're a first-time gardener or advanced, tree diaper will improve the way you water your plants. Every time it rains, tree diaper recharges. Made in the USA... Check out all the sizes they have available at TreeDiaper.com. That's TreeDiaper.com. It is as easy as we say it is. We've got some videos on that on our website, the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com, our parent website. You can search Tree Diaper, and uh, it is really that easy. A lot of it takes the guesswork out of everything. Well, Holly, we're going to talk about here uh, the history of canning. Now, this could be an hour or two hour long PBS special you know, uh, fundraising video that, or, or episode you'd see on PBS, but we're going to try to we're going to try to knock it down in about fourteen minutes uh, to give you the basics because we all can, but we maybe not understand where all this and how all this came to be. So and then on December first of two thousand and four. Yeah. Okay, Ben walked into his kitchen and saw the pickles setting over the. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so this goes back to seventeen ninety five. Okay, so Napoleon. He, you know who Napoleon is? Yeah, I know who okay. Napoleon is. Yeah. He's that guy. Great, great movie. Right. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> Napoleon says, I want to offer a word of 12,000 francs for the invention of a new food, new food pro- preservation method. So, um, so he wanted to, to have some food preservation right. going wanted, on. Yeah, so he could have stuff anytime. Yeah. Um, so then finally in 1809, somebody named Nicholas Appert wins his Napoleon reward and he comes up with this book, writes this book, it's, and it finally got published in 1920, um, but it's called The Book for All Households, The Art of Preserving Animal and Vegetable Substances for Many Years. Okay. Many years. So I looked through this book. <laughs> you can find it online. Okay. And it's stuff like, it's, it's basically like is candy. It, is it worth the read or is it one, is it a oh snooze goodness. fest? It's a snooze fest. Okay. There's not, I don't think, I didn't find any pictures, <laughs> but... Yeah. So it's stuff like salting meats and then placing them between two plates and then wrapping like to twine. a certain degree. Some of the things that we read about in the in the Bible of how yeah. in the Old Testament how they preserved things over for past uh, over through the season. But then it's stuff like putting fruit into sugar mm-hmm. and making like a jam. Uh-huh. And then there's stuff like boiling and making like a seal. With um, into jars or what, bottles. What modern day we know as right. Yeah. So it's it's definitely like a basis of canning and food preserving. In this book that was a snooze fest, it didn't tell you how many thousands of people died from eating bad food until they figured out how to get this thing right. Did it? No. Okay. Because no. and I joke about that, but there is a certain oh, we're level. We're going to talk about okay. that. Okay. Okay. Go ahead. In 1810, Peter Durand he creates the tin canister for commercial canning. And there's a book that you could read. It's called The Canyon of Peas. I didn't read this. I didn't look through this book. But it came out in 1909. The U.S. Department of Agriculture Bureau of Chemistry. Okay. Okay. In 1812, this person opens the first cannery. This is more of the industrial canning. The, the, the tin cans that you see on yeah. the shelf. Yeah. Then we jump to 1858, where now we're familiar with the name John L. Mason. Patton's the Mason Jar. He makes a mason jar. Yep, that's correct. So there's that. 1884, the Ball Corporation starts manufacturing the glass jars in which we are familiar with. Um, the Kern Home Canning Book. The Kern Home Canning Book. Well, first, okay. uh, I think we got kind of mixed up here. Um, Elizabeth Kerr, or Alexander Kerr, made the Kerr Glass Manufacturing Corporation, okay. 
to start the home canning supply business. So we had the ball and we had the kern. Right. So then we'll go back to the 1945. Right. I don't know how that. Now, goes as you order. as you get going on this, um, people now today, ball owns kern. Yeah. And I see these comments. I'm not buying a ball product ever again. I'm only buying kern. Well, kern's been out of business technically, and ball bought them out. So whenever you buy anything, you're all putting money in the same pocket. So there are some uh, independent jar right. manufacturers and lid manufacturers, but for the most part, there you go. I think like Golden Harvest. Golden is Harvest one. is one of them, yeah. 1914. So this is when home demonstrations, agents at work in the field. So basically, uh, home canning went to like the 4-H clubs. Um, the USDA started to encourage people to learn how to home can 1917 the usda says that pressure canning is the only way to safe process low acid foods which is still true today yes so here's here's a little bit of a morbid history okay in 1931 12 people including some children die after consuming improperly home canned food at a dinner party in north dakota oddly that that's documented like that it's yeah well uh, whatever. This is from the USDA website. Okay. So that's how it's documented. Okay. So 1939, World War II begins. And at that point, there was a peak in home canning in the early 40s. And because they over, because of the the shortages of the food. Victory Gardens. Victory Gardens, things like that. And so there was more than 4 billion cans and jars processed during the time of World War II. Now, side note, the blue or the you know the light blue jars that we're familiar with were manufactured between 1896 and 1937 uh, and the font on the jar will identify the decade in which that jar was made so there's a nice little handy tip there when you're looking at jars and the other question people get at, ask is how much is my blue jar worth it's worth however much somebody's willing to pay you. There's not really, unless you get the purple ones or the the uh, brown. brown ones, those are the big, big and that was like the 1870s, 1880s, somewhere in there. That's where the big money's at. The typical blue jar that we see, there's really just, it's whatever somebody's willing to pay. That's pretty much the value of what that jar is because so many were made. Right. So then there was a, there was a lull in the canning. So what had happened was after the war, uh, people started going back to work. and then Life were, got back to normal. Right, life got yeah. back to normal, and then the refrigerator became very popular. And this is where people are like, I don't need to preserve my food. I got this icebox, like literal icebox. Right. Yeah. So, But then in the 1970s, the do-it-yourself boom, probably uh -huh. the, I would say the first do-it-yourself boom happened. I don't know what sparked this. I guess we'd have to do more research on that. But then people started buying canners again, and they mm -hmm. got back into canning. Well, and for the... For the homesteader, for the uh, farmer, for the country people, canning never went out of style. This is what you did. You planted a big garden. You preserved as much as you could, put up for the winter, and you knew how many quarts of this or quarts of that you needed in order to get you back through the, the winter into the next growing season. Yeah, and that's why... When you told me I was going to can, uh -huh. I said, I thought canning was only for country folk. And you were wrong. I was wrong. <laughs> I am not country folk. No. <laughs> okay. So then in the 80s, um, 1988 to be exact, the USDA came out with their first published guide. It was called the Complete Guide to Home Canning. And I'm sure you could probably find that at your local library to this day. Right. And 1993, the Food and Drug Administration published its First, comprehensive food code poster illustrating improper canning proce uh, pr procedures. Uh, the, the don'ts, uh, the 1943, you know, they back then they kind of did things and then we reversed a lot of stuff then. Yeah, it's like don't, um, like don't get distracted. Follow the, follow, follow the instructions. Follow the instructions. Yeah. You can't omit certain ingredients. You have to use everything in which it's listed for the science to be precise and to make the food safe to eat. Don't overstuff the jars. Mm -hmm. Don't start a fire. Things okay. like that. So that is, um, yeah, so that's kind of the history of canning. And now we'll talk about kind of the different types of jars. Uh, we're... My grandparents and probably some of you are old enough to uh, remember or did partake in many of the preserving items were canned in half-gallon jars. 
Now you are, uh, it's advised not to can anything in half gallon jars except for grape juice and apple juice because the core temperature of the jar, the material in the jar, cannot get to a high enough safe level of heat in order to kill the bacteria that uh, can be harmful to you. Uh, then they require. Then, then the quart jar became the more popular jar for the, some smaller families or single uh, households. Pint jars or half pint jars became uh, fulfilled. Uh, uh, became a, a norm. And you know, then there's you know the wire clasp, and now we know we've got the two piece lid. We had the zinc lid, and all of that. So the jars have progressed over the years from colors to different types of lids to much safer than what uh, our parents, our grandparents, and our great-grandparents dealt with. But back then, they probably didn't know that what they were doing wasn't safe because they kind of did what they needed to do to survive. And I think a lot of it was is just technology right. and word of mouth and uh, food safety guidelines, mm-hmm. things like that. Um, and the zinc lids, those, I think the zinc lids are cool, but it makes sense why there's the two piece lids these days. Right. Are you familiar with how a zinc, how the zinc lid actually worked in, no. in the process? Okay. Um, there was a rubber gasket that went on top of the actual glass jar and then you cranked the zinc lid down and somehow it sealed and there it went. Now in Europe, they still use, I think they still use the, the wire clasp and a rubber gasket. Because they call it jarring over there. They don't call it canning. It's yeah. called jarring. Yeah. Um, so, and then we've got, you know, we all, many of you may have collections of jars either passed down that you use or that are uh, decor or novelty items that you have collected or been given. Uh, we've got a number of those in the studio. We've got a four gallon jar. Yes, a four gallon jar. We've got a two gallon jar. We've got a one gallon jar. Now these are the, the one gallon jar is not the new one that they came out. These are gl- glass jars with the wire clasps that mimic old traditional canning jars, but have a much larger quantity to them. Not for canning usage, simply for decorative purposes. And we are still trying to confirm or uh, eliminate the possibility that Ball made a three gallon jar. We've got a we've got a half pint pint quart half gallon, gallon, two gallon, and four gallon. And uh, my common sense would say, why did Ball not have a three gallon jar? If they made a one, two, and four, you would think they would have a three. So if you can help us out with that, since we have the platform to reach a lot of you, uh, give us a email at gardentalkradio at gmail.com and let us know if you know for a fact if Ball Canning made a novelty three gallon jar. We would sure like to know. So the history of canning... Um, it wasn't quite what maybe you thought we were going to go through. We went through from uh, all the way from 1795 to present day to kind of tell you the stepping stones of where and how it all began to what we are currently aware of today. And the Nas- National Home for Food Preservation recommends uh, on the recipes what time frame or is it safe to use a recipe when it when you have a book or what what's the guidelines on that? Um, basically, two thousand five or sooner. Okay, so that's when um, that's when they they kind of last changed their. Uh, I don't want to say With, change within, their standards within about fifteen years. But yeah, fifteen years they kind of because food has changed, mm-hmm. uh, just growing conditions and things like that. So the nutrient value the of nutrient, food has yeah. changed. Yeah, even just like tomatoes, you used to not have to add acid to your tomatoes, and now you do because of acidity levels and all that stuff. So, so yes. It changes with the, the safety of it. And um, so, you know, keep that in mind. If you've got an old classic ball canning book, keep it around. Put it in a you know, shadow box, whatever you want to do. But it would not be safe to use those recipes. And I understand. I know there's some of you out there going, well, I've used this since 1968, and I haven't got sick. And, Holly, your response to that is? Well, that's okay if you want, but I wouldn't take any chances. Right. <laughs> I, good for you. Good for you. I practice safe canning. Uh, we practice safe canning. That's what we encourage people to do. So I'm not going to tell you 
Yes. Uh, no. Can at your own risk. Right. Right. Well, uh, summer's over. Holly nights are getting colder. Days are getting chillier. Kids are back in school. And the lawn has been forgotten. And if we forget about the lawn, those Japanese beetles will guarantee be there for next spring to attack everything you've got growing. Yeah, just because it's fall, we don't want to forget about our yards and those Japanese beetles either. They may be gone, but they're not far. Not only do they feast on your roses and berries this summer, they laid eggs in your turf so they can start again next year. You can take a stand with Phylum's Grub Gone. Grub Gone is a non-chemical BT granular that specifically targets scarab pests and their larvae. Simply apply the granula granular with a spreader or irrigate into the soil and let the naturally occurring bacteria do its job. Not only is Grub Gone easy to use, it's the only non-chemical choice effective for controlling grubs. And the best part about it is non-toxic to bees and other beneficial pollinators. So you don't have to worry about them picking, picking up any toxicity, taking it back to their hive and killing the, the, the uh, hive. You can find all this out and get a hold of some Grub Gone from Phylum Bioproducts, the natural choice. That's P-H-Y-L-L-O-M, bioproducts.com. We'll hang out. Carly McGuire, author, be with us momentarily. Have a garden question? Give Joey and Holly a call now or anytime 24-7. Just dial 1-800-927-SHOW. If you can't get through, leave a message and they will call you back. Call now, 1-800-927-SHOW. Protect your plants against damage with a 3-in-1 plant guard and special blend fertilizer. Visit ivyorganics.com. Brought to you by Blue Ribbon Organics, providing locally made organic compost and soil blends for gardens, farms, landscaping, and more. Visit blueribbonorganics.com or call 262-497-8539 to find their products nearest you. The Gardening with Joey and Holly radio show is brought to you by the following. Simply Earth, Seed Savers Exchange, Quick Snap Sprinklers, Water Hoop, Timber Pro Coatings, Bloom and Easy Plants, Pomona Universal Pectin, Ivy Organics, Tiger Torch, Happy Leaf LED, Seed Link. Find all sponsors at the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com and thank them for their support. Welcome back to The Gardening with Joey and Holly radio show. Moments away, Carly. Macquarie will be with us but first yellow jackets rescue has the solution to that issue in your backyard or on your property yeah as the end of summer occurs you'll notice more aggressive yellow jackets flying around yellow jackets are looking for your barbecue meats your sweet drinks as well as water resources you can keep them at bay with rescue water Rescue Yellow Jacket Traps. Rescue Yellow Jacket Traps are eco-friendly do-it-yourself option to keep those stinging pests away from you. These traps use a powerful lure for Yellow Jackets, but they will not attract the beneficial honeybees. All rescue products are made in the USA. You can go to rescue.com where you can buy these Yellow Jacket Traps and other pest control solutions. That's rescue.com. Holly, let's go to the hotline and bring in our guest for this week. Carly McQuarrie is passionate about growing her own food, using it wisely, and urban homesteading. She is an author, an urban homesteader, and the creator of The Little Green Shoot. Welcome to the program, Carly. Thank you so much, Holly. It's great to be here. Well, we thank you for taking time out of your day, not only to educate Holly and myself, but all of our listeners across the country. And we'll just jump in it right now. What You're all about small space gardening. And what are your best small space gardening tips, if you, if you could provide a few of them for uh, Holly and me and our listeners? Yeah, so many. So one good one is raised beds. Those are great because you can put them anywhere. Um, Growing vertically is good. So growing on trellises to save space that way. I like to grow smaller varieties of things. So when you're in the country, you can grow those enormous pumpkins and things like that. Where we're on a city lot, you might want to do like lettuce, carrots, things like that that are small. Um, also seeing your space with fresh eyes. So putting gardens in places that you might not normally put them. So like I have an herb garden in my driveway (laughs) and some raised beds in my front yard. The parking strip to my house is like a little mini orchard. Um, so those are some good things, but my favorite is to just grow what you like. Um, I think a lot of times it's easy to, to just kind of get wooed by something at the store and bring it home. But if you're just using the space for what you truly love and will want to use, um, that's going to save you some space in the long run, too. When you talk about the different varieties, there's so many garden 
seed manufacturers now have hybridized or have found varieties that naturally grow in a smaller, compact type of situation. There's uh, patio corn. There's cucumbers that grow in a bush instead of a vine. There's compact tomatoes. So there's a lot of choices out there that people may not be uh, aware that exist. Totally. Such a great point. Yeah, that's true. Okay, so you're very passionate about urban homesteading. Some people might not understand what that means if they have to get goats and put them in their small backyard or something. What, <laughs> what, what is urban homesteading? Yeah, so I definitely don't have any goats or cows in my urban backyard. We don't even actually have chickens. <laughs> but um, we, drew, we do grow a lot of our own food. We're, um, you know, we actually live behind a bar on a busy street on a city lot, but we're able to grow a ton of our own food. Um, so by urban homesteading, it's basically just growing and preserving as much as your own food as you can, even though you're in a city or a small space. But I think sometimes people want to, like, think they can't do it or give up because they don't have enough space. But I mean, you can definitely supplement your urban homestead from farmers markets or local farmers, even different um, suppliers. So it's basically like providing you and your family with healthier alternatives, a lot of times, even ones that you grow yourself. And then using that and keeping it throughout the year is how I would define it. But there are probably lots of different definitions out there. Right. Everybody's urban homestead is defined to their requirements and their needs. Um, was go Whenever you moved to the location you're at now, was the urban homestead, was that a goal? Or did that kind of morph into and kind of become what it is today just by time and circumstance? That is such a great question. It's definitely something that just evolved. I always wanted a garden. Uh, I started working in greenhouses when I was a teenager. I just always had a passion for plants. And like everywhere I turn would kind of be a door closing in my face. You know, I grew up in the forest and there wasn't enough sun. And then I moved to California and my, my backyard was sand. <laughs> you know, I lived in apartments. And so finally, when we moved here, even though it was still a city lot, I had enough sun to finally grow a garden. And so, um, you know, as you start your garden, I'm sure you guys know, like, there's all these different stages that you go through. And um, for me, I was finally finding success as a gardener. And then I'm like, what do I do with all this stuff? You know, there's only so much you can cook or give away. And that's when I started really getting into preserving what I grow and making it last throughout the year. So just kind of it just kind of evolved naturally and kind of took me over, I would say. <laughs> now, not everybody is big on canning what they grow. Are you a canner or are you more dehydrator or refrigerator storage or how, how do you get the most out of what you grew? Yeah, definitely. I do. I do all of that. So we got a dehydrator a couple years ago that's totally changed my life. I love it. Uh, we use that for lots of different things. Um, I've got raisins in there right now from when I harvested some grapes. Um, my goal this year was to grow enough tomatoes to can for the whole year. So I've been canning a ton of tomatoes. Um, we've got blueberries in the freezer. <laughs> right now we have a porch filled with apples. We're going to take <laughs> over to our friends next weekend and make some cider out of. So kind of all different things. That's a lot of fun. So you do have a free guide on your website. Um, it's the Beginner's Guide to Urban Homesteading. And what's your website so people can find it? And why should our listeners go there and check that out and all your other great information? Yes. Yeah, so my little uh, my website is called thelittlegreenshoot.com. And it's a good resource. There's tons of free articles on there. It's great for people who are getting started um, with urban homesteading or even if you live in the country, just a beginning gardener. It's got lots of tips and tricks. And then it's also got things, um, articles about how to preserve what you grow. The guide is great because, well, obviously, who doesn't love free things? <laughs> but um, it's just kind of an introduction to what urban homesteading is, how you can get started, different resources. Um, I've got some recipes in there for um, making your own garlic powder and also your own French fries if you're growing potatoes or if you want to cheat and grow, uh, get some from the store. French fries, French fries are delicious either way. Um, and also how to grow and store potatoes is in there. So it's just a nice little free guide to get started. And I think people <clears throat> need something like that because how to grow a tomato, you put that in your favorite search engine. There's 973,000 different ways. <laughs> And if if there's something tangible or something that has a very simple guideline, here's what worked for me, here's how you can do it, here's how simple you can do it, and here's the reward that you can reap from it, 
it really puts people at ease and, and takes a lot of the confusion or hesitation out of starting a garden, whether it's one container or a backyard. I'm so glad you brought that up because I think that we're all just really hard on ourselves and we think that, you know, things are complicated or hard and we can't do them. And I have kind of a passion for making th- things simple and letting them be easy. And um, I think the more we can just support each other and, you know, garden, you, you guys know gardens also filled with failures and that's totally fine. It's part of the process, you know, but just, just having the courage to get started and it's not a big deal. Everyone can start easy, you know? Yeah, definitely. Um, so, you know, you obviously have learned a lot in your, your time of urban homesteading. What's something you've learned that in regards to urban homesteading that will always stick with you and you're really happy you learned it? Um, honestly, it's kind of where my garden is. I'm kind of an introvert and I always wanted my garden to be in the backyard. And with my small space, I've had, I've been forced to have my garden out in the front yard And just by being out there all the time, I've met so many people in my community, my neighbors. Um, You know, last night we were out there picking apples and sharing with everybody. And little kids are like, these are real apples that you can grow, (laughs) that you can these are real apples we can eat just growing on this tree, <laughs> you know? And so that's honestly been one of my favorite parts is my connection to my community through my garden. But also, you know, it's just so, it feels so good to look around and, you know, have your shelves be filled with things that you actually grew yourself or throughout the seasons, just seeing, you know, each, each thing has its own kind of time and place and they're all so beautiful. And so just watching the seasons go by um, is really exciting for me still. And and you speak about being in the front yard and, and connecting with the community. You know, many people know this, but they don't want to. Uh, they, they don't comprehend it. There's a lot of good people in the world. There's a few bad people that make everybody else look bad. You know, a little drop of oil in a puddle of water makes look bad. But you connect with so many people, regardless of who they are. And like you talked about the kid there, knowing you know he never knew or he or she never knew apples basically grow on a tree aisle nine of the grocery store that's where we get food it's introducing people to what can be done in their own community exactly and it's been fun too because a lot of my neighbors are growing uh gardens now too or people will drive by and stop and they're like i just ordered some garden beds like yours (laughs) you know or what and so it's just been like a really fun way to get to know my neighbors and i think you're right there are so many good people in the world um and it's nice to get to see more of them yeah, and I, I, I get it with the being an introvert thing because I am too. And people are always like, well, you have a radio show. And it's like, well, this is how I <laughs> connect with people. I, I'm not the type to go up to a stranger and be like, hey, what's your hobby? This is their hobby matches mine. It com- comes to me. <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> Um, so you like to grow your own tea and maybe other people want to as well. I know we have. Maybe Maybe people are currently growing something that they could make tea out of or what are some plants that they might be growing that they can use for tea or what are some that some that they can grow for tea? Oh, I'm so glad you asked that. It's, I think a lot of times too, people are like, wait, I could make tea out of that, you know, because it it's just basically you cut the herb and dry it and now you have tea. And so one that people might also be, may, might already be growing is raspberry. So if you have raspberries growing in your yard, of course, the fruit is amazing, but the leaves are amazing medicinal um, plants. And so what I do before it blooms is I harvest a bunch of raspberry leaves and dry it. And then I drink a cup of that every, every night of the year, practically, because it's good for any reproduction and hormone issues, but also inflammation and detoxification and building up your iron. So that's one that I really love, but also even like thyme tea or lemon balm, kind of any herb you can think of. If you Google it, you'll see it's got a million medicinal benefits and you can make a tea out of it. Was there any teas that you grew thinking that this is going to be the best thing and you turned out and you made it and it was like, not the best thing for me. (laughs) That's a really good question. Um, I know I've, I've enjoyed everything I've grown as a tea, except my mint gets spider mites really bad. So I have to, I have to harvest that like super early, <laughs> but so that's probably my biggest tea fail mm. is, is spider mites and my spider mites in my mint bed, but pretty much everything I've tried to grow as a tea, I've really enjoyed, but I kind of like those earthy tastes that maybe some people wouldn't too. <laughs> right. 
which which tells me that you don't use chemicals, you're organic. Otherwise, you could spray something on that in order to kill the spider mites, but you choose to go the, the organic way. Yep, I do. And sometimes I'll spray them with an organic spray every once in a while, but I just... You know how there's some parts of your garden sometimes it seems like no matter what you do or try, right? <laughs> that's just that that problem is there, and that's kind of my mint bed, yeah. which is good because mint can take over when it oh, gets yeah. too healthy. <laughs> so. Absolutely, and that's you know you always want to be careful of that. Put it somewhere where you know it, you don't you don't if you put it in the ground, put it somewhere where you don't care if it takes over that portion of the yard because it will. Exactly, so true. So, how can people find out more about you? Uh, see what you're doing, get your, you know, your free guide, purchase your books. Uh, where can we all go for that? Yeah. So um, my website, the little green shoot.com has um, the free guide. And then also um, I have a, and I have a sale going right now um, for a guide to growing and storing onions. And then also a guide, a toolkit to help you if you're trying to get started gardening and want some help learning how to create your space. Um, those are both on sale, but there's tons of resources on my website that are completely free to help you get started too. And I'm also on Facebook and Pinterest, but I would say I spend most of my time on Instagram. And um, my name is the little green shoot. And it, there's a period between every word. So the period little, you know, mm-hmm. um, but that's where I hang out the most and you can find me there a lot um but and then the website has lots of good resources well it's a great website for anybody that's new at gardening or want to kind of restart or review what you've been doing if not been successful it's a great great resource there and carly we greatly appreciate the time you've offered us and our listeners and sharing some of your knowledge with all of us thank you so much it was so fun to be here with you guys i love your show absolutely well we thank you very much for that and when we come back it's your garden questions our garden answers this is the gardening with joey and holly radio show got a question for joey and holly send it via email anytime to garden talk radio at gmail.com You move your lawn sprinklers all over the yard, but you always end up putting them in the same spots. Why not just bury them there? Out of sight, always ready to use, pre-adjusted to water the precise areas you want. Quick Snap Sprinklers makes it easy. In-ground sprinklers without the hassle or expense of laying pipe. Put the sprinklers anywhere in your lawn or garden. Snap on a hose to supply the water. Water on, it pops up. Water off, it drops below ground. You can mow right over it. You can have a buried sprinkler system up and running in just minutes. Each quick snap saves thousands of dollars. They install in minutes and operate for years. Visit quicksnapsprinkler.com. Rinse kit, your hose on the go, pressurized water at your fingertips without pumping or battery. Simply fill from your spigot or sink on your way out to the garden, beach, or anywhere. Spray it, wash it, rinse kit. The Gardening with Joy and Holly radio show is brought to you by the following. Blue Ribbon Organics, naturally green products, Ironwood Tool Company, Easy Step Products, Rinse Kit, Soul Brew Kabucha, Wild Delight, Rikon Vitova, Chip Drop, Bailbuster.com. Find all sponsors at the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener.com and thank them for their support. Welcome back to the Gardening with Joy and Holly Radio Show. Happy you've been with us for the program today. Getting close to the end of our season. We've got a couple more shows the end of the month, and uh, we will take a hiatus, and we'll be back in March of next year. We'll take more inform- <clears throat> we'll share more information on that as the time draws near. Had a number of questions come in this week, Holly. Let's see what we can get through to the top of the hour. All right, and first question is, should you use shade cloth? You've talked about squash leaves wilting during the hottest portion of the day to reduce their surface area. So wouldn't using shade cloth be better solution for the squash and other plants that are stressed by the hot temperatures? Well, that's a good question. And shade cloth is a material that is manufactured that reduces the amount of sun coming through it. Uh, you can get different percentiles of that, uh, typically a 40 to 60 percent reduction in sunlight um, can be used and placed over a plant or plant area in order to basically put it like a sunglasses on the plant to protect it a little bit. It, you can do that. Works well. Um, some, But this will be more beneficial in areas where it's prolonged seasons of 
triple digits or 90s plus because a lot of plants, their pollen, they don't pollinate when it's super, super hot. The only disadvantage to using shade cloth, there's a couple of them. One, the appearance. Now, you can have shade cloth close to the plant or you can have a canopy that you can drape the shade cloth over. Uh, wind or storms can also be uh, not good for the shade cloth based on where and how it is placed over the plants. You could use shade cloth uh, in areas where it's super hot. We choose not to because uh, in the northern portion of the United States, we don't get those prolonged seasons of triple uh, digits temperature. So I think we answered that question. I uh, gave enough information there. Um, you can make the decision what's best for your growing environment. Okay, so next question is, does feeding the soil work in containers as well? Absolutely. We talk about feeding the soil in the ground. Feeding the soil in containers is really more important than feeding the soil in the ground because as you water, as you as it rains, that water grabs hold of nutrients and flushes it out of the bottom of the container, not because you're overwatering it, just because it's the natural procedure that soil and water uh, that happens. In the ground, the water will pull some of that nutrients down, but the earthworms and the microbial life will bring it back up and kind of intermingle it a little bit. In a container, once it flushes out, it's gone. So topping the plant, topping the container with more organic compost potting soil, that's good. Feeding the soil with a compost tea or a organic fertilizer a couple of times during the season, also very important to prevent the nutrient loss for the plants so you can have the most healthiest plants you possibly can during your growing season. All right, Ken, in question here, Holly. Uh, we've been asked this many times, but I think it goes. Uh, it's good that we answer it again. I see on social media, canning groups, where people are proud about what they have canned. They show the jars, but they're flipped over. What's this about? Is this necessary? And should I be doing this? No. <laughs> um, Can we give a little more context to that? No. Well, okay. Of course. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. So no, do not do not do this. It's not necessary at all. It's you. You should just not do it at all. What? Where did this practice come from, and why is it still practiced? Okay, so it's still practiced because. They watch their grandma flip the jars okay. and maybe they watch their mom flip the jars and somebody else flip the jars and then they're like, this is just what I'm going to do. So they did it back in the day because they used paraffin wax and so that helped the wax seal, basically. Airtight. Airtight. Get yeah. all in the nooks and crannies yeah. in the jar. Yeah. Um, but now you don't want to do that. It can. Are you even supposed to use paraffin wax today? I mean, we no. see it. Uh, we see it for sale at the store. A lot of times people use it as like a decorative thing. Okay. And sometimes people use it, they put their hands in it. Okay. Like I remember being young and mom would use it to seal jam and jelly. Yeah. And then we would, the fun part would be puncturing that wax and then pulling it out and then getting the jam and jelly out of the jar. We were country people, okay? <laughs> <laughs> My face. Yeah. But anyway, that I remember that. So was you it old? Was it only, <laughs> only for gra gra uh, jams and jellies, or did they use that for other ingredients or other? I think they methods? used it for other methods, uh -huh. but I, it's just not it's not something that you would do. Okay. Um, there is a two piece lids, and that's what's safe, and that's what's good, and that's what you should use. Don't flip your jars. There's no reason to. Right, and and I can't figure out. You know, these pe obviously for somehow they're sealing with the pressure of the liquid pushing against the jar. You want to allow the jar to seal naturally and correctly without any additional forces, whether you or putting the jar upside down. So don't flip your jars over. Not a good thing. Bad, bad, bad. Don't do it. Um, and you'll be better off as a canner if you don't. Well, with that being said, we are out of time, and we thank you for yours. Did you miss any portion of the show today or would like to revisit? You can certainly do that by going to your favorite search engine and typing in the Gardening with Joy and Holly radio show. Uh, or we can send you the link to the program uh, by sending us an email to gardentalkradio at gmail.com. Tune in next week to the program. We are going to be talking about urban homesteading and nut trees. Our guest will be author and founder of the Grow Network, Marjorie Wildcraft, and we'll answer your garden questions. So until next week for Holly Baird, I'm Joy Baird, and we will see you in the garden. Mm -hmm.